So welcome everyone. My name is Felipe from the Charter for Compassion. As I was telling you, I'm here with Thomas Jackson and with Salish Rao, who will be talking to us about a prayer for compassion. Um, after their brief introduction, we'll watch, we'll have the viewing of the film, um, which is about an hour and a half uh, time, um, complete the movie, and then we'll have a Q&A followed by the movie screen. So Thomas, Salish, would you guys like to introduce yourself and a little bit about the movie before we get going? Well, I'll just... Um... <clears throat> Introduce myself. I'm Thomas Jackson, and uh, I'm the director of the movie. You'll see in the movie how the movie came to me out of a meditation and out of concern for the future our children have. But I look forward to answering any of your questions. Just make sure to write down anything you want to know, and when we're done, we'll have a great Q and A. And I'm be happy to introduce my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Silas Rao. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Uh, this is a beautiful movie, and I'm privileged to have been a part of it right from the outset. When Thomas had this uh, idea to create the movie, he went to Victoria Moran, who contacted me, and I joined the team soon after. And it is, uh, I'm sure you're, you're all going to enjoy this movie. It is an eye opening movie for a lot of people but it is very well done. And Thomas to me is a, is a, mas he's a master movie maker. So, thank you so much for this opportunity. Absolutely, well, thank you so much both for introducing this. So let me now share my screen and let's start with this movie. And we will see you all in about an hour and a half. How can we expect ourselves to have lives of joy and freedom and spiritual clarity when we are sowing the seeds of the opposite of that? It's almost like some mad scientist, like Satan himself, <laughs> designed these systems that are being used now to raise animals. It's in, it, it is absolute insanity. I don't get how you can love everything Jesus says and then participate in a mechanized uh, system of mass slaughter that involves pain beyond your wildest imagination. Even keeping quiet and silent about the violence, you are part of that violence. There's another passage in the Quran that says that uh, because of the wrongs of humanity, there has been much corruption seen in the oceans and, and, and on land. So for a few moments in which we're enjoying what is really just a palate preference, we're taking what is most essential to animals, you know, their very lives. And uh, that's the opposite of compassion, it seems to me. We are ashamed of our ancestors who own slaves. We are ashamed of our ancestors who believed in segregation, so too our grandchildren will be ashamed of what we allowed to happen on our watch. Each of us has to ask ourselves a spiritual question. What side do I want to tell my grandchildren I was on? Was I on the side of mercy and compassion or was I on the blind side that helped to perpetuate suffering? This is my daughter Melody. She's the reason I'm making this documentary. It's for her and it's for all the children who will inherit whatever world we choose to leave them. Oh. We got a potato. Thank you for this food and let it nourish our bodies and our spirits and let it keep us healthy and 
happy and full of life and love and compassion for all of and creation. Be vegan. Be vegan and be a champion for the people and be a champion for the planet and be a champion for the animals and be a champion for ourselves. And for all of these things, we say thank you and so it is. And be a champion for the animals, so it is. <laughs> I haven't always been a vegan. I was born in a small town in South Georgia during the late 60s, and I was raised a Southern Baptist, and I grew up eating a Southern version of the standard American diet, comprised mainly of meat, dairy, and eggs, mixed in with huge helpings of fast and processed foods. And like so many other kids eating the sad diet, I suffered the sad consequences which ranged from mild asthma to severe allergies to tons of ear infections, styes, viruses, and zits, and too many more ailments that were considered normal to list. Okay, um, I'm making this video for, you know, my family back home, and, uh... Um... I'm making this, okay. I'm making this video, I'm looking at the mic, okay? It wasn't until my mid thirties, living in New York City and attending a Unity Church that I became a vegan. It was studying the teachings of Jesus about kindness and compassion and starting a daily meditation practice that really led me to a nonviolent diet. Even though no one at Unity or anywhere else had ever even suggested I be vegetarian. And I never even heard the word vegan, much less knew any. Though it wasn't long before I started noticing that during Sunday brunch, the same ministers and chaplains who were teaching me about kindness and compassion for all were for some reason not including the innocent animals on their plates. But who was I to judge the choices of another? So I decided to live and let live and try to be a good example. And that worked for almost a decade until after my daughter was born. And suddenly, I found myself with skin in the game and a reason to care about what happens in the future. Really? Is that so? And then I saw the documentary Cowspiracy, where I learned that not only does animal agriculture create over half the greenhouse gases on the planet, but it's also the number one user and polluter of water and the major cause of deforestation. Not to mention that the grains we use to feed billions of animals that we breed just for slaughter could much more effectively be fed to humans and could help save the nearly nine million people who die from hunger each year. I felt I had to do something, but I didn't know what. So I did what I often do when I don't know what to do. I prayed and I meditated about it. And during that meditation, this question popped into my mind. How is it possible that a compassionate, spiritual, or religious person could support an industry that is responsible for the unnecessary suffering of billions of people, trillions of land and sea animals, and the devastation of the very planet we live on? That question would end up taking me on a journey throughout the United States and around the globe to explore the teachings of kindness and compassion that form the basis of all the world's main religions and the not so main ones as well. And try to understand how so many people of faith are doing unto others that which they would never wish done unto themselves. The journey started when I traveled back to New York City to speak to Victoria Moran, who I had met once years earlier when she spoke at the Unity Church I attended while living in that beautiful city that never sleeps. I personally don't understand why some of the people that I admire the most, people whose words and whose writings I completely revere, are eating our fellow creatures. Victoria Moran is a much sought after speaker, best-selling author, and host of the Main Street Vegan podcast. She's been an animal rights activist and vegan for over 30 years. A great deal of spirituality is about belief. That's why we call it faith. I'm a person of faith. I'm a Christian, a yogic Christian, 
And yet I understand that there are people who have other spiritual beliefs and other spiritual views. So what can bring all spiritual people together as a whole believing community? To me, that is compassion. Because compassion is at the center of the message of Jesus. It's compassion that got the Jews out of bondage and to the promised land. We have all the Eastern religions that are ahimsa-based, nonviolence-based. So can we all agree that however we see God, however we see the road to salvation, being compassionate to one another and expanding that compassion out to all that has life is the true essence of spirituality. What else could it possibly be? Which I think all the world religions, if you distill them, the wisdom down to one sentence would be something like this. Whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others. And this basic understanding to give to others what you would like. Another way of saying it is, whatever you sow, you will reap. <laughs> it's also the same thing. Whatever we put out, it'll come back. Victoria put me in contact with Dr. Will Tuttle, who's a musician, an international speaker, and the best-selling author of the World Peace Diet. I sat down with Dr. Tuttle in Ocala, where he and his spouse Madeline were currently living in the solar-powered RV that they use while traveling around the country, speaking about animal rights and performing music. From the time we were born, we were forced to participate in mealtime rituals by our parents and teachers and, and everyone in our community that essentially numb us and disconnect us and so that when we get older we take out our wallets and we vote for it and we don't just vote for it then we then eat it <laughs> so we actually bring it into our body we give it to our children this is uh, not only toxic from the point of view of the level of physical health but it's toxic from the point of view of our spiritual health from the point of view of our cultural health from the point of view of our ethical health we don't actually hold the knife ourselves we don't actually hold the electroshock prod ourselves we don't actually hold the raping sperm gun ourselves and fire it but we pay someone else to do that and so we pay other people to do things that bring out the worst in them and yet all we see is something wrapped in plastic and styrofoam very often served with a smile <laughs> and so there's this deep disconnection in our society and i think it's that deep disconnection that is the greatest obstacle to authentic spiritual awakening the authentic inner spiritual teaching uh, of all the great religious uh, wisdom traditions are pointing in the same direction kindness and compassion for all living beings is the path of awakening for all of us. My next stop was Encinitas, California, where I would sit down and visit with Bob Isaacson, Buddhist, Dharma teacher, and co-founder and president of Dharma Voices for Animals. The teachings of the Buddha regarding compassion and non-harming towards animals is not being followed by many, many, many Buddhist uh, practitioners, teachers, and Buddhist centers. The Buddha said to his followers, if there is no eater of meat, there, there will be no destroyer of life. Whatever the karmic effect is to the person eating the animal, the person who has to slaughter the animal, the person that has to raise that animal for slaughter, is incurring um, extremely unwholesome karma. Oftentimes, um, people who cannot find other jobs, people who are exploited terribly in slaughterhouses and in factory farming, why should these people incur negative karma, killing animals and raising animals for slaughter, when all we have to do is eat a plant-based diet? Compassion is such, a, it's such an important key part of all traditions. Uh, but really looking at what that meant and how it extends to all living beings is a really important piece. <laughs> um, so I have to say, these two, sure. these two lovely guys, they don't get along <laughs> very well. Oh. Need a little more compassion. <laughs> yes, yes. I had left Bob and I traveled north to the hills of Topanga, where I met Lisa Levinson the Sustainable Activism Campaign Director for In Defense of Animals and the founder of Vegan Spirituality. 
I can recall being in a spiritual circle and raising the energy and doing some wonderful rituals. And then directly after that, we went um, to have lunch and the lunch was a barbecue. And I just felt that energy drop all the way down to the ground and below because it was, it was just stunning to me that no one there thought, wow, these animals that they're eating have anything to do with spirituality. I had had similar experiences in other spiritual groups, and my friend Sandy had had the same experience, and just was, we were both so surprised that people who, who consider themselves spiritual and, and loving animals um, would, would eat animals. From Lisa's, I headed down to LA to attend my first ever animal rights conference. It was much bigger than I had expected, and suddenly I felt a little less lonely as a vegan. So the Good Food Institute is focused on making alternatives to animal products as delicious, as convenient, and as inexpensive as possible. So if we had been having this conversation 150 years ago, uh, people of faith would be saying, slavery is in the Bible, you know, women are not chosen by Jesus to be his disciples, and we need to apply that sort of central organizing principle to politics. There certainly are, you know, many times in the Bible, slaves obey your masters, wives obey your husbands. Uh, so these concepts, up until 150 years ago, were used to justify things that pretty much no Christians are going to continue to attempt to reconcile with their faith. What is the core of Christianity? It's love. Is what we are doing to other creatures love? And for what purpose? Humans have no need to exploit other animals, certainly no need to eat them. There's just simply no way to be part of any world religion and not care about the suffering and the premature deaths of other animals. As a moral philosopher, I can say that ethics teaches that anytime there is suffering, it is morally considerable. And religions agree with that. So there's simply no way to be indifferent. I have asked hundreds of people this simple question. The question I ask is, would you ever deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? And so far, 100% of the people I've asked have said, absolutely not. You would never do that. So which means that compassion is at the core of our being. You know, that's who we really are. This is the reason why, collectively, compassion is going to win. Silas Rao is the founder and executive director of Climate Healers, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to reforest over one sixth of the ice free land area of the Earth. He is the author of Carbon Dharma and Carbon Yoga and a co producer for the documentaries Cowspiracy, What the Health, and The Human Experiment, as well as the one you're watching now. In the Laudato Si that came out last year, Pope Francis said, it is contrary to human dignity to cause animals to suffer or die needlessly. And then he visited the US and in New York City he had a veal and lobster dinner. So that's when I realized how much suffering that these religious leaders are going through. Because you know, when, when what we say and what we do are not in alignment, we suffer. We suffer tremendously. Well, concern for animals has long been a part of Unitarianism and Universalism. Jeremy Bentham was a Unitarian legal scholar who in the 1860s said that the morally relevant question about animals was not whether they could reason or whether they could talk, but whether they could suffer. And it's so clear now uh, with today's science, as it was clear then to anyone with common sense, that animals do suffer greatly, especially those in our food system, uh, as it's been practiced in the past 50 years. I was raised vegetarian and went vegan after I learned about what happens to dairy cows and egg-laying hens and factory farming and farming at large. So I'm really grateful that I made that decision. Now, it's also consistent with my Zoroastrian teachings in that Zoroastrianism teaches good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, telling the truth, taking care of the environment, showing kindness to animals who are at our mercy, and of course, taking care of our body temples as well. The concern, a concern is with a capital C. This is an issue that the spirit has laid upon the heart of a particular friend or party of friends. 
that it they feel they're called to speak up about it, to do something, to speak truth to power. And this is one of the reasons why friends have offered leadership in the regard to human slavery, uh, the equality of women, uh, prison reform, and things of this sort. So we who are Quakers, who are concerned about the animals, consider this as a concern that God has laid upon us. And if people feel uncomfortable with it, to just relax and try to consider perhaps this is a legitimate concern. Perhaps the Spirit may be speaking to you through our words. Just uh, be open to it if you can. I have looked at a lot of different religions over the years and my book, Peace to All Beings, goes into that quite a bit about looking for the core truth in each religion. And it turns out, as everybody pretty much knows, that love is the core truth of every religion. And then people come along and try to organize it and try to uh, put rules on it and twist it around so it fits a certain mindset. And in many cases, the, the patriarchal mindset of domination, which started with animal agriculture, has affected, infected a lot of religions. There's a bumper sticker that says God's original plan was to hang out in the garden with some naked vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> It was during the AR conference that we had our first meeting of the Interfaith Vegan Coalition. Judy Carmen, Lisa Levinson, and myself had started the coalition to provide faith-specific resources and tools for spiritual and religious individuals and institutions to help them widen their circle of compassion to include all of creation. You know, I think a lot of people are under the impression that all Native American people ate all meat all the time. And the fact is, they actually ate very little meat, depending on the region that they were in. After the conference, I drove up the coast to Petaluma, a small city north of San Francisco. There, I spoke to Linda G. Fisher, an artist, interspecies communicator, and Native American tribal member of the Ojibwe Nation. I had someone say to me, oh, gee, you, you know, you're vegan. You've been vegan for so many years. It, it must be quite a sacrifice. And I, you know, I kind of smiled and said, it's no sacrifice at all. Once you know that animals feel, think, and love, and hurt, and cry, and embrace their babies, you know that it's not a sacrifice at all. Um, and so I explained that to her. I said, what would be a sacrifice is if someone forced me to eat meat to, <laughs> to save somebody else. Um, that would be quite a sacrifice. I think if some of our great chiefs were alive today, they would be horrified and they would be incredibly heartbroken because they themselves would never do what we're doing today. If they didn't have to hunt, if, I, if they didn't have to kill, I don't believe there's any way they would have ever done that. I wasn't back from California very long before Melody and I loaded up our trusty hybrid, Sophia, and left on a road trip down into Florida. Our first stop was Ocala, where Melody's grandpa, Mike, joined us for a potluck at Kindred Spirits Farmed Animal Sanctuary. Mike actually was bought as a gag gift for somebody's wedding, and then after the wedding, they just tied him up outside the church and left. The next day, our friend Logan, the director of Kindred Spirits, gave us a private tour of the sanctuary and introduced us to several of her furry friends. You want to say hi to her? You can. She's very nice. She's a big nose, and it's soft. You can pet her if you want. She's very nice. There you go. Her nose is almost as big as your hand. <laughs> That's how she says hi. And she opens her mouth and she says, <laughs> that's how a pig says hi. It's nice to meet you. So Felicia and Gomer are from a factory farm in Iowa that flooded back in 2008. And so the farmers, they evacuated, but they left all their pigs um, 
locked up in buildings. So a couple of the pigs were able to escape and swim to freedom. And Felicia and Gomer um, and their friend Calypso, who's since passed, were, were part of a group that was rescued um, by Farm Sanctuary. And then they were placed here with us a couple years ago. Um, they both kind of retired to Florida. They both have uh, pretty severe arthritis, which is really common in the factory farm pigs because we bred them to only live about six months before they're used for food. So they're really not bred to live a long time. And they're bred to get as big as they can, as quick as they can, which means that it puts a lot of pressure on their leg joints. So um, these two are both about nine now, and so arthritis is fairly common at that age. Their friendships are just really deep with each other. Like these guys came out of the factory together and they've been together ever since. It's just, um, I think, really important to them to have that kind of connection with each other, especially the guys from factories because they kind of start life without it. Like they can't touch their moms, which is really important. And the only real physical contact they have with anybody is a negative. So I think once they come into sanctuary, it's really nice for them just to be able to have time with each other and like quality relationships with each other. And they grow to like us too. Like these two really like everybody. They love to meet new friends all the time because now they know it's safe and nobody's gonna hurt them. And... From Ocala, we traveled down to Tampa where we visited with our friends and I had a chance to meet and speak with Bawa Jane, Secretary General of the World Council of Religious Leaders. A body that brings together the world's preeminent religious leaders and see if these people can work together on the issues that impact us most, whether they be the environmental challenges, the issues of poverty, health, conflict. It's just harnessing the power of religion for the global good of all, not just some. I come from a tradition, a way of life called the Jains, is one of the oldest way of life in the world. Live and let live, that's what we try and follow. Why are Jains vegetarian? Let's just understand that. When you talk about non-violence in thought, action and deed, how can you be a practitioner of ahimsa of non-violence if you are going to consume any living being? My guru came from the tradition where the Jain monks wear a face mask. They also carry a little broom made out of cloth that before they sit anywhere, they can brush off any form of life so they do not commit any violence and kill them. Similarly, the mask, the face is also that even the microorganisms in the atmosphere should not be killed. Now it is proven beyond doubt that if you want to get rid of the greenhouse gases, get rid of the slaughterhouses. It's a ticking bomb. It's a ticking bomb. Do we want that for our children and our children's children? How will they judge us at that time? What karma are we sowing that knowingly we are not taking any action? When we know something and we don't do anything, that also is creating karma, which is negative for us. Hey, Melody, you know where we're going? That's right, to the vegan cooking contest. There's going to be like, what, 1,200 cookies to be eaten tonight in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Susan Hargreaves and Animal Hero Kids invited several local Fort Lauderdale bakeries to offer up their best vegan cookies. And then everyone there got to eat one of each cookie and vote for their favorite. Melody and I thought all the ones we tasted were yummy, but didn't have enough room in our bellies to try them all. In the early 80s, 1980, I learned how most animals are treated by visiting stockyards and slaughterhouses. And uh, for 34 years now, I have been teaching kids about being kind to all animals. AnimalHeroKids.org is my baby because I know from visiting the schools that the children are naturally compassionate. They want to help animals. They want to make sure no one gets harmed. They're genuine and sincere, and their clear voices Pardon me. Oh, can you tell me any, any reason why you don't want a pet monkey? Yes, I can tell you lots of reasons. They smear their poop, they urine wash, they masturbate in public, they will bite your children, and they have big teeth. I had said that to one woman, she said, oh, it sounds like my husband. <laughs> but... Our next adventure would take us to Jungle Friends Primate Sanctuary in Gainesville, Florida 
where Carrie and her dedicated team of compassionate caregivers provide a healthy, happy life to over 300 primates who are ex-pets or retired from lab experiments and others who have suffered exploitation, abuse, and neglect. I talked to a researcher actually where I said, whatever happened with your project? Did you figure out, and I won't go into exactly what they were trying to figure out, and he said, they're never going to figure it out because even if they did and they could, they won't have their jobs and their grant money will end. So they are, it's just going to always be something that they're going to be trying to figure out. They're meant to be in the wild. I mean, yeah. there's no way you can make it right with them living like this. I mean, this is wrong. I wish none of these guys had to live like in this. In the cages, I want you know? all of them to be free. I want course. them to be free. Yeah. I don't want them in your living room. I don't want them at the lab. I don't want them at the zoo. And I don't even want them here, but there's nowhere for them to go. It was at Jungle Friends that I reconnected with Maya Barak, a holistic veterinarian from Tel Aviv, Israel, who I had met at the Animal Rights Conference in L.A. Maya would join Melody and me for a two-week road trip that would take us through 13 states on our quest of compassion. Our journey started with a visit to Ruderville Animal Sanctuary, where Maya would introduce us to her friend, Elaine West, the founder of Ruderville and a devout Christian. You change your diet and change your life. That's what I love to tell people because it's true. And it's not just your health. It's physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every way, this will change your life. And it's going to open you and soften your heart. And we're not supposed to have hard hearts. Adam was a gardener. God put us in a garden. Uh, that's our first clue. You know, our body is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us. And we treat our bodies like dumpsters, right? You don't put trash in a temple. I know a lot of people my age in their 50s are facing this where they go to the doctor and all they get are more pills and told this is a way that you're going to live for the rest of your life and you're going to just have to manage these diseases. Well, when we choose God's way, our body can heal itself. And to me, this was amazing. My arthritis, after three months, I woke up one morning and I had no more pain. And that was a miracle for me. And I had lived with an inhaler and on all kinds of medication because my allergies were so bad. I had pneumonia twice. They told me if I had pneumonia again, I could possibly die. They told me that I would have to live with that inhaler and my condition would only get worse and worse. And you know, the doctors are quick to give you more medication. They're not very quick to give you any hope. When you share this information with Christians, it's almost like, I don't know, like a wall goes up that they would rather believe the world system that is pills and procedures and, you know, medications and problems your whole life. Uh, they, would, they would rather choose that than God's way. Plants heal our body. We're digging our graves with our fork. And it's really sad when you see people that have things like diabetes and heart disease and cancer even, and they're praying for a miracle while continuing to eat the Western diet, the world's diet. They continue to put that in their body, which is causing the problem. They don't see that they're killing themselves. Genesis 1.29 is part of the first conversation between God and human beings recorded in the Bible. And God tells Adam and Eve, you are to eat the plants and the seed-bearing fruit, period. And immediately after that, God says, and it was very good. And it's the first time in the creation story that God describes creation as very good, tov ma'od. Up until that point, God just says, it's good, it's good, it's good. But when we get the instructions to eat a plant-based diet, now creation is very good. After Ruderville, we drove Sophia up to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we spoke with Jeffrey Cohen, the executive director of Jewish Veg whose mission it is to help Jews to embrace plant-based diets as an expression of the Jewish values of compassion for animals, concern for health, and care for the environment. Considering what Genesis 129 said, it got me thinking, what does the rest of the Bible say? Why aren't all rabbis and clergy and ministers vegetarian or vegan if this is what it says in Genesis 129? So I started 
reading, researching, and to my pleasant surprise, it's actually a pretty consistent theme in the Bible. That a plant-based diet is the ideal, that meat eating, while permitted, is usually framed in a fairly negative and sometimes extraordinarily negative light, and that um, we're supposed to be treating animals not just with compassion but with exquisite sensitivity. You know, there's a whole slew of verses in the Bible that command that we treat animals with, with such sensitivity. Collectively, these are known in Hebrew as Tsar Balei which translates to the prevention of suffering to animals. And it says in our Talmud, which is the main rabbinic commentary on the Bible, that not only are we to prevent animal suffering, we are to relieve the suffering of animals whenever we have occasion to do so. And on that basis alone, given how animals are treated today in modern animal agriculture, there's no way we should be consuming animal products. Probably the most misunderstood, the most distorted verse in all of the Bible is not Genesis 129, it's what comes right before that. Genesis 126. That is the famous dominion verse. So yes, it does say in Genesis 126 that human beings were granted dominion over the animals. But two important things to consider about that. Number one is that it's part of the exact same conversation in which we're instructed to eat plants exclusively. So clearly dominion did not give human beings the right to kill animals for food. Secondly, that Dominion verse is part of the exact same verse, not just the same conversation, but the same verse where we're told that human beings are created but selim Elohim in the image of God. Therefore, we are to exercise dominion the way that God exercises dominion over human beings. And any rabbi will tell you the primary attributes of God's dominion are mercy and compassion. From Pennsylvania, we headed northeast to Athens, New York, and visited with Frank Hoffman, who serves on the advisory board of the Christian Vegetarian Association, and is co-founder with his wife Mary of the Frank and Mary Hoffman Family Foundation, which is dedicated to cruelty-free living through a vegan lifestyle. We became vegan for a reason of compassion, but the side effect was that our health improved dramatically. We had all kinds of problems, aches and pains and arthritis starting and uh, coughing and sneezing things, that, that, you know, head colds, irritable bowel syndrome, all kinds of things like that. And we found that within about three weeks of becoming vegan, our health improved. We didn't have these same symptoms. Both Mary and I are in our late 70s, and we haven't taken medication. I don't know, it's got to be at least 25 years now. But we don't get the chronic diseases that people get. The Bible tells us that if we're a child of God, we're to be a peacemaker. And that as peacemakers, and Paul picks up on this and he says, as peacemaking children of God, we're to help free creation from its present corruption. Well, part of that corruption is the way we live. We've heard people say, when I buy an animal product in the supermarket, I didn't hurt the animal. I'm just buying the product that's sitting there. And I'm saying, no, you are actually contributing to it. The first thing you can do, and the most important thing to do in saving this world and to living in the heavenly will of God starts on your dinner plate. When we left Frank and Mary's, we drove down to New York City, where we parked Sophia and traveled by transit. Our first stop was on the Upper East Side, where I had the honor and pleasure of meeting Pramoda Chichurbanu, who is the director of the Jain Meditation International Center in New York City, as well as on the board of PETA India. She is the author of several books, including The Book of Compassion and Rainbow Food for the Vegan Palate. Only because of the taste buds, only because of our own greed, only because of our own satisfaction of the senses. When are we going to become sensitive? When are we going to understand? Because each and every living being is given a different instrument 
and it's a symphony and we are creating a music out of that instrument and we forget that each and every one's life is intertwined with each other how can we disturb one living being but when we take the dairy the meat industry the cows you are snatching away the five senses of those living beings who can hear who can see who can feel who can taste who can smell we have no right to take the life of any living being even though they are not human beings but they are they have already got five senses and with a one shot we destroy that our heart should really tremble to do all these things and we don't have any qualms but the violence is not because of the bad people it is because of the silence of the good people so be a whisper or be a scream just be the voice for the voiceless be after we left promoters we traveled down to union square where we were approached by Mike, a compassionate wildlife activist who was out raising awareness about the plight of the elephants. You said it's like white elephants, not like pigs and chickens and stuff like that. So elephants are a, uh, they're called a keystone species. Are you familiar with that term? Yeah, but okay. it's not great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stay me on the so a keystone species basically is a species of animal that has such a uh, disproportionate effect on the ecosystem that were they to disappear, uh, things would change very rapidly. So elephants are a keystone species. Um, bees are a keystone species. Even humans are, but in a bad way. Oh, yeah. So like if we all suddenly disappeared, everything would just start getting better. But everything would get the same for Right, sure. but everything yeah, it would better. change. Exactly. Yeah. So elephants are a keystone species. Uh, chickens are not. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's not to say that they're less important because they are still very important. And I do think that our, our meat industry is really, really messed up. Really, really bad. And I would love to see that change. Hey, can I ask you this question? Yeah. Did you know that in order for a cow to produce milk, that, uh, she had to be impregnated every year and her baby taken away after the first day of her life? And if it's a male, it usually goes to veal industry. If it's a female, she ends up in there. Within four years of their life, they are slaughtered for meat, and usually they would live 25 years of their life. Did you know that they were taken away? No, no, I didn't know that. Okay, I mean, I, I, again, I'd have to... I, it's it's very difficult to take the word of somebody. Not not to say that oh, yeah. I don't think you're well, a whore. But, but first of all, do you think the cows just make milk? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know enough about them. Okay. That's that's really what I can. That's the best answer. Yeah, I don't know. While we were in Manhattan, we stopped by to see Victoria, who told us about a cow she met many years ago during her visit to a slaughterhouse in southern Missouri. I meet a lot of people who say, well, I only eat humane meat. I only eat meat from small family farms. Well, these cows came from a small family farm. The farmer drove them in himself. You could tell that these cows knew people and trusted them. So the first couple just walked up the chute and on to death. But the third one was not having any of it. She saw her friends go first. She heard the screams and she smelled the smells that I'd been smelling all day. She was not about to walk up that ramp. So she just planted herself and stood there. And the man up at the top of the ramp, about time to go home, he was ready to go see his kids. He whistled to her. He whistled to her the way he'd whistled to his dog when he went home in 20 minutes. And this cow seemed to trust him. She kind of turned her head and looked at him, and it was as if she was deciding whether or not to override all her instincts, what she was hearing, what she was smelling, and instead do something that we pride ourselves as humans in being able to do, trust another person. So with this trust misplaced as it turned out, she walked to the man who had whistled to her. He got her with the captive bolt pistol. She was hoisted up, her throat was slit, 
Her beautiful skin was sliced off her and into a pile to go for shoes and boots and belts and handbags. And all of a sudden, she was no longer a being. She was in the process of becoming beef. Now, I knew that in a few days, her parts and pieces would wind up at a supermarket in St. Louis. They would be on a styrofoam tray and cellophane wrapping, and they would be purchased by good people. They'd be purchased by people who love their children and give to charity and go to church. Well, they didn't know her. I did for just a few minutes at the very end of her life. But because I knew her, it's my obligation to share her story. In the Muslim faith, we have this really beautiful saying from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in which he says that none of you truly have attained to faith until you love for one another what you love for your own self, which is very similar to the golden rule that was preached by all of the great prophets and sages. You know, I think as time has gone on, the spiritual and ethical tradition has been able to widen that to not only humanity, but to a lot of the creation of God, uh, both in terms of the environment, as well as the animals and just every, every living being. From Manhattan, we drove to Princeton, New Jersey to speak with Imam Soheb Sultan, Princeton University's first Muslim chaplain and author of the Quran for Dummies, and the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. We are living in a time in which there is a great exploitation of the environment and of, of animals. And the way that we see the farming practices evolve to fit the consumerist societies and the materialistic societies that we have formed has greatly harmed the environment and has greatly affected animals at a, at a level unprecedented in our history as human beings. One should really consider the mass production of food and the unethical means by which that food is produced in our modern age. And we should really consider whether we want to be part of that evil practice or whether we want to be part of the solution to restore the balance to the environment, to restore the balance to the ecosystem, and to restore the balance to the human beings. Because when the human beings are exploiting their environment, the environment is going to turn its wrath against the human beings and we're and we're constantly seeing that from the lack of access to water to air pollution uh, to scarcity of food all of this is being caused by our mistreatment of god's earth you know there's a really important passage in the quran that says that oh humanity your actions are certainly bound to rebound against your own selves <laughs> So there's this idea that whatever we do, we're going to see its consequences, both the good and the beautiful and the ugly and the wrong. Uh, and it's also I important for as Muslims to understand that, that, that this idea of karma, this idea of our actions rebounding against our own selves is not only limited to this life, but there's also an afterlife reality to it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he said that on the day of resurrection, when people will have to answer for their deeds before God, one will even have to answer for the innocent sparrow that they killed. What is the difference between pity and compassion? So pity is, you know, I see the cow, they just ran it through a factory farm, it lived this awful life, they slaughtered it in this awful way, and I'm like, poor cow, that's bad, they're torturing all these cows, this is terrible, wow, I'm hungry. Where's the closest McDonald's? You know, no link whatsoever. Versus compassion, which is, you know, they're suffering in this industry, they're suffering in the way that we treat animals, they're suffering in eating suffering from the way that this animal was killed. You know, I don't want to contribute to that suffering. I quit. I'm not going to contribute to your suffering. It was in Tacoma Park, Maryland, where we met Nazarek Amen, a naturopathic doctor, a practitioner of Chinese medicine, and an organic farmer who's been vegan for over 25 years. In the beginning, I worked actually as an EMT. I was an intermediate level medic. And, you know, working in the medical system while studying to be, uh, become a doctor, 
at that time and just seeing the contradictions it's not focused on prevention it's really focused on these sort of quick fix pharmaceutical interventions and you know as a provider you know when someone's having a uh, an asthma attack and you go in and you give them drugs and you know you see that asthma attack break and those people can breathe again that's beautiful you know but in another you know four weeks six weeks three months and you get the same call you know it sort of takes some of the glamour out and you walk into these people's homes and you see like they're having this asthma attack or this sickle cell crisis or whatever other disease and here you know right next to the bed they've just got through eating a three pack for a dollar glow-in-the-dark set of cookies with a big glass of cow's milk and you know you're asking yourself the question you know do you think that you know any of what you just ate has anything to do with how you're feeling right now you know we don't really get to ask that question you know I mean I felt better immediately from from going vegan but in a couple years after I went vegan I was probably the strongest I've ever been in my life and um, you know I maintain that on a day-to-day -day basis so you know uh, anyway I'm 95 years old and <laughs> I had this one case, I remember this woman very well. I, I said to her, I said, you know, your problem is not the that you have a spastic colon. They said you're eating foods that are gonna make you sick because they contain lactose. And to my surprise, she said, oh, I know that. And I said, well, if you know that these foods are gonna make you sick, why are you continuing to eat them? And she said, because the government says I have to. The US dietary guidelines say that I have to include dairy foods in my diet in order to be healthy and I of course explained to her that no you didn't that you don't need dairy foods for any reason that they're as I said to her cows don't drink milk but there's plenty of calcium in their milk and it's because they get it from the green plants that they eat and that if you eat green leafy vegetables you'll get plenty of calcium in your diet but it really upset me that people were being made ill by listening to recommendations from the government that were not based on science, but rather were based on marketing. We left Nazarek's farm and crossed over into Virginia, where we had a conversation with Dr. Milton Mills, who practices urgent care medicine in the Washington, D.C. area, and is on the National Advisory Board of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He is a practicing Seventh-day Adventist, which is one of the very rare Protestant denominations that recommends a vegetarian diet to its members. God designed us, and he gave us an owner's manual, and it's called the Bible. And in the Bible, he tells us what we should be eating. He tells us what he designed us to eat. And if we care about ourselves, and if we care about what God wants, then we will follow his instructions for a healthy life. And when I see people who call themselves Christians eating fried chicken and pork chops and all this stuff that they know is unhealthy and that's going to destroy their health simply because it tastes good, then I have to ask, do you love the pleasure of eating this unhealthy food more than you love God? Because if you really love God, then you would do what he asks us to do, and that is eat a plant-based diet. And when you realize the 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 type of misery and pain and suffering that's inflicted on other animals in order to raise them by the billions just so that they can be killed and dismembered and people can eat them. It's impossible for, uh, I think, a feeling person to justify that, particularly someone who says that they believe in a loving God. It's one thing if, you know, it's a matter of life, death, and necessity, but in modern life, it's not. The next day, we had to say a sad goodbye to Maya, who was off to a holistic veterinarian conference before she headed back to Israel. And then Melody and I and Sophia made our way back to the sacred woods of North Florida. Dabra, kadabra. The environmental crisis is not a crisis of the bees and the birds or the trees and the toads. It's a crisis of how we live as spiritual beings in a physical reality. Therefore, in order to address this crisis, we're going to need to address the spiritual roots. Just a few days after Melody's fourth birthday, I found myself on an airplane 
headed to Marrakesh, Morocco to join our producer, Silish, who had invited me to attend the 22nd United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP22, where people from all over the world come together to work on finding solutions to the climate crisis that is threatening the future of life on our planet. What are some of those spiritual roots? This includes the desire for instant self-gratification, consumerism. We are facing a climate crisis, a planetary emergency, which is really messaging to us that the human way of living is out of balance. By the end of the 21st century, human beings are likely to extinct 5 million of the 10 million species on this planet. And so, according to the Jewish tradition, it is forbidden to extinct a species. We have a mandate to be stewards, to care for the creation that God has entrusted to us, to be righteous, to be mindful, and that comes down to the smallest level of human consumption. Everything that we consume, we need to think, am I elevating this object in the highest way? Am I using it in holiness? Am I reusing it? Do I actually need this? If we do that, then we're living at a higher vibrational frequency, we're living in resonance with the divine, we're living in resonance with, with the planet that God has given us. We know that of all the uh, uh, energy that human beings are putting into the climate system via the greenhouse gases, 93% of that is ending up in the oceans. And this has led to uh, uh, an increased acidification of the ocean. The acidity makes it very difficult for shelled animals uh, to continue to fabricate their shells. And so we're beginning to see threats to uh, coral reefs, we're beginning to see threats to uh, shelled animals in general. And the most important ones are the little coccolithophores, part of the plankton population. And if their shells are compromised, they can't uh, live. And the danger will be that these are the guys, the, the plankton are the ones that are actually manufacturing the oxygen in the atmosphere that we breathe a few weeks after it leaves the ocean. So, uh, Ocean acidification is a global uh, issue that affects absolutely everybody and all of the living things in the ocean. It's my belief that societies that, in which people care for each other are societies that will also take care of the environment. And so there's a, a relationship between our human compassion and our compassion for nature. And now uh, both are needed to assure the survival of our uh, civilization. I would say that compassion is, is, is central to our religious tradition within Islam. And as a Muslim trying to be faithful to its teachings, I have to uh, strive to become more compassionate in my life. Uh, as an example, every chapter of the Holy Quran's 114 chapters begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which means in the name of God, uh, most compassionate, most merciful. A small chick fell out of its nest in the tree onto the ground, and one of the Prophet's companions was playing with it in quite a ruthless, ma ruthless way. When the Prophet came upon him, he became very stern and angry. And he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just amusing myself. He said, how can you amuse yourself with the child of someone else that's not your child? Return the child to its mother. And what's very interesting is, in the Arabic language, they have two words. The word normally used for baby chick is one word. The, the, the word that is used for child, which is exclusively used in the human sense, which means awlad, is the term that he used for this chick. So in other words, its relation to its mother is the same as the relationship of a human mother to its own child. Uh, in fact, 84% of the whole population claim that they are religious people. So first of all, we have to consider ourselves as a part of the problem. As a member of the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches, I am in the Ecumenical Group of the WCC.
And my role here is to remind our leaders and the negotiators to behave like responsible parents, to look after their children and to realize that the whole humanity is one family and we have to protect each other and above all, of course, to protect uh, our planet for the future generations. So compassion means to be merciful, but means also to protect justice. And uh, if we fail to protect justice, then we risk our security, we risk our peaceful coexistence. And when we protect nature, when we protect animals and anything around us, this is the best way of preparation to protect also ourselves and to protect the whole humanity. We pray for our leaders, we pray for the people not to have uh, who they, they suffer. So when I finish my prayers, I have to find ways to participate in the problems, how to change things. If I pray for the people who they don't have water or food, I have to find ways to go, to give the food. For one uh, tap, we cannot give water to the whole people. But for the ones who pass next to you, you can give them water. Last year, in the run-up to the Paris climate talks, a number of religious organizations issued statements on climate change and so our organization issued the Hindu Declaration on Climate Change for 2016 and that was signed by over 60 Hindu leaders and organizations from across the world and within that we put forward the case for why Hindus should be concerned about climate change and what Hindus should and could be doing to address climate change and within that one of the key things we spoke about was diet and to live a lifestyle which minimizes harm on the environment, on animals and on other people. And so within that, the advocation of a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle was something that we strongly said that Hindus, actually not just Hindus, all concerned people of the world should take very seriously. If we want to create a world which is full of compassion, which is full of love, which is full of peace, then we have to imbibe that and live that within our own hearts and minds. Because we have a system, a socio-economic system that's growth-oriented and that's based on consumption as an organizing value and competition as an organizing principle. And because it's growth-oriented, we, we have been growing our population and our livestock continuously. See, if you look at what has happened to the biomass distribution of the planet, our weight is now double the weight of all the wildlife from 10,000 years ago and our livestock is two and a half times our weight. And what is worse is that our livestock eat five times as much food as we do because they're mostly young animals and they're eating a lot in order to grow. It's as if you have a bunch of weightlifters who are lifting five times their weight and they discover that they are on quicksand and they're sinking. So what is the first thing they should do with the weight they're lifting? Should we not drop those weights? Or should we continue to hold on to them? That's the situation we are in at the moment. But we are in a society where we are taught to look outside for happiness. We are taught, you know, that's where it is. And the entire socio-economic system depends on us believing this, that the happiness is outside us. So we really are at a position where we have to change our socio-economic system. We have to change it so that we are looking for happiness inside, all of us, so that we are reducing our demands on the earth and therefore allowing the earth to come back, you know, to regenerate again. Veganism is a way of living where we seek to never deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily. No longer is it necessary to eat animal foods. So knowing that, we can now get in alignment with who we really are, because all of us want to be compassionate to all life, because that's who we are. So the most important step that an individual can do today to address environmental destruction is to adopt a plant-based diet, which is as local as possible, which is as organic as possible. So it's local, organic, vegan eating. It's love. The day before I left Morocco, I joined thousands of environmental activists from all over the world as we took to the streets of Marrakesh in a march for climate justice, hoping one day that these marches will include justice for animals as well. How does India have the largest export of leather products in the world and can still be a cow-friendly country? On the second day of 2017, 
I once again found myself flying over the ocean. Holger Eich, one of our producers who lives in Hong Kong, had invited me to join him in India, where we would explore the teachings of compassion in some of the world's most ancient spiritual traditions. We would start our journey in the city of Mumbai, where we spoke to Nitha Shanti, who lived six years as a Buddhist monk and now travels internationally, sharing practical wisdom teachings for happiness and enlightenment. I used to think for a long time, I need to be like the Buddha. I'm not, I'm not enough like the Buddha. I need to be more like the Buddha. And one day it settled on me that I'm not the Buddha. <laughs> I'm not the Buddha. Even if I try my very best, I'll be a second-rate Buddha. But my eyes shone when I realized even if the Buddha tries his best, he'll be a second-rate Nityashanti. <laughs> In the Buddhist tradition, this is the word for compassion is Karuna. And Karuna is known as one of the noblest states we can experience as a human being, one of the most noble qualities, most. It's called actually a boundless state. When your mind is imbalanced, all you're concerned about is me and my little world and, and at the most people around me. But as your mind gets more and more balanced, you realize all beings, we are all in the same boat. We all seek to be free from suffering. And so the response to a, of a balanced mind to suffering is compassion, is the desire to alleviate that suffering in whatever way they possibly can. And that's compassion. Vedanta is Indian philosophy which originated in the Vedas, but it is simply knowledge of yourself. Vedanta says there are three distinct types of thoughts in a human being. The highest is sattva, which is called pure thoughts, unselfish thoughts, compassionate thoughts, loving thoughts, thoughts that contemplate on the higher, the transcendental. A person who is in sattva, pure thought, will not do anything that harms others and to eat the flesh of another creature because you find it tasty or even if you think it's nutritious is um, abhorring to a person with pure thoughts. Vedanta says at all times in your life you must have an attitude of not wanting to injure, hurt or uh, be nasty to anyone in thought, word, or deed. While in Mumbai, we had the wonderful opportunity to visit a beautiful, world-renowned Jain temple, where we had the pleasure of speaking with Irby Shaw, a devout Jain who gave us a tour of the temple. I am a Jain, and very proud of it. Actually, we believe the most in non-violence towards any kind of living beings, be it animals, birds, or even microorganisms, which is why we are pure vegetarians. We do not have any eggs. Plants that even grow underground, which are called roots, basically potatoes, onion, garlic, carrots, beet, all of these things are out of our purview uh, because uprooting them would mean killing a lot of microorganisms, which is why we avoid all of these. So non-violence is basically the foundation of my religion. Do you consume dairy at all? Yes, I do. Now, it may be different here, but in the United States, like in order for a cow to produce milk, they artificially inseminate her once a year. And yeah. Within 24 hours, they take her baby away. Oh my God. It's a male, they take it to the deal industry. Oh, that's so that's, that's a terrible thing to do. But in India, I guess, we, we worship cows, so I mean, however advanced we are becoming day by day, there are still people in rural India and probably few even in urban who actually worship cows. So for us to do such a terrible thing to them, I'm not sure if that really happens. But now that you mention it, I think I would try alternatives to it, you know, to reduce my consumption. Often I ask my patient, do you take milk? And they'll say, no, 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 I hardly take milk. I don't take milk. And then we sit down and start writing down, chai, yes, curd, yes, maybe ice cream, yes, maybe paneer, yes, maybe ghee, yes. And it can be literally like half a liter of milk every day. So you do consume milk. If you have just consumed one slice of cheese, you have already consumed 16 ounces of milk. The Indian subcontinent in Asia is very obsessed with dairy products because it's so deeply ingrained that they think it's vegetarian. Milk production is very high, it's highest in the world. In fact, India is one of the largest exporter of beef in the world, thanks to the dairy industry. Because after repeated artificial insemination three or four times, 
about six or seven year of age now cow is spent she's of no use also the young calf you know the baby male calf is allowed to just die and so the wheel is produced because there's no use of male calf anywhere in any industry from the times of Lord Krishna we consume so much dairy it's there in our temples as prasad it's there are any good occasion marriage everything is made from dairy ghee particularly is used a lot so it just doesn't go out of the psyche of Indian mind so I had to write a book on dairy alternatives and show them the way that you can make buttermilk you can make yogurt you can make ice creams you can make all the Indian sweets same way exactly same tasting even much better even even healthier one of the first patients I remember was a man who had diabetes but that's not why he came to me he had diabetes and he was being given medicines and the blood sugar wouldn't come under control but he came to me because he had the complications of diabetes he was losing his eyesight and when I suggested to him to stop all the dairy within two weeks his blood sugar came down and his eyesight came back it was just so amazing and then over a period of time he went on a whole plant-based diet and improved even further so this this was one of my early cases which brought to my mind how much changing our diet really helps because our body always works to heal I actually realized that medicines come in the way of healing in fact medicines never cure but the body heals I also run a 21 day residential program where we have people coming in with all kinds of diseases and we do all the lab reports at the beginning and as they get better we take off medications and they're given buffet meals and we have cooking classes every day we have yoga meditation and within 21 days most of them get off at least 70 percent of the medications many of them are off all their medications and they have more energy than they ever had before and we do lab reports all over again at the end so that they can actually see the difference between the two reports and even I'm amazed not only they are amazed but I'm amazed every time how fast the body can actually heal if we take away all the things that make it sick Holger and I left Mumbai and flew over to Udaipur where we met up with Silish and I ran into Dharmada, a friend I had made during the animal rights conference in LA. She introduced us to our friend Ashutosh and together we all traveled out to Animal Aid Rescue where we met the founder, Jim Myers, who along with his wife, daughter, and 50 full-time staff members and volunteers from around the world have rescued over 65,000 injured and ill street animals, including dogs, cows, camels, and donkeys, just to name a few, since they opened their gates in 2003. In the state of Rajasthan, it is not legal to euthanize a cow. Any of the other animals you see here, the monkey, the the blind dogs, the, 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 the uh, handicapped dogs, all can be euthanized. But the cow is given this special protection. A dairy in the city, somebody, that cow, there, this one, that one, stopped giving milk, and at night it was pushed out into the street. And cruelly, the same one that you say is so holy, we aren't even going to euthanize them. We're so, we're so enraptured with their spirit to keep it alive. Every single cow represents an abandonment, that it was not profitable to feed that cow anymore, to do any more with it. So you've removed it and you've broken a law. This animal at night would be eaten out by dogs and pigs alive in the streets with no medicine to alleviate pain, no, no one to shelter its eyes in a 49 degree Celsius day to move the flies away. And here, it was the only way I could get not happy, because it's nothing to be happy about, but I could get satisfied that some justice was being done. So that this cow, which this dear lady is helping us with, this cow is going to die in a few days. It's not going to be, its legs aren't going to get stronger and get better and return to the city, find its long lost brothers and sisters. The least favorite question a serious 
politician in India wants to hear is what happens to the male cows. And so that story has to be suppressed if you're going to keep up all the sensitivity. So no one shows the links. What I see is cows running around in the cities, on the streets, eating trash, eating plastic. They are coming to animal aid because they are injured by cars. They get in accidents. They have broken spines. They have broken legs. They have plastic in their, in their stomachs. And this is how you treat your mother, the holy cow. I wish that all that spiritual people, that they would stop talking about compassion, that they would really practice compassion and stop drinking milk and dairy products because this is what causes so much pain and suffering and death. If we unconsciously hurt animals, we cannot be in peace, we cannot be in harmony, we cannot come home if we unconsciously hurt other beings. We can find peace only if we practice peace. Vegetarians don't know what they are doing to animals. Vegetarians are in a misconception that they are very kind to animals despite they are consuming milk, wearing leather, wearing silk, pearls, fur, everything. In India, since cow is treated as a holy creature, milk is given the status of nectar. People know that alcohol is not good for you. When they smoke cigarette, they know it's not good for them. But when they drink milk, they think they are doing good to their body. They are being good to the holy cow also. They think that by milking a cow, they are protecting a cow. They are thinking just the opposite of the reality. It's not holy, it's sinful. And what is sin should be recognized as sin, not as holy, not as sacred. Veganism is just a result of your own compassion towards all being. And compassion is just a realization of your connectivity with the nature. When you connect with your nature, with all the beings or other whole of existence, you spontaneously become compassionate with everyone. After visiting the royal palace and two Hindu temples, the Jagdish and the Karni Mata, I had to say goodbye to Holger as he flew home to Hong Kong, and I journeyed forward to New Delhi, where I would have the unique opportunity to speak to two Digambar Jain Satus, sky-clad Jain saints, who have freed themselves of all attachments and worldly possessions, including clothing, money, and even dishes and silverware. The Jain religion is saying, leave and let live. We don't use any animal products. Non-violence is the uh, uh, very uh, highest thinking. Non-violence is main thing of all religions. The Jain religion is said to be around 5,000 years old, and it has a rich history of non-violence and vegetarianism, and has libraries filled with their collective knowledge and wisdom. Yet there was really only one question I wanted to ask these holy saints of Ahimsa. तो ये कह रहे हैं कि अगर ये हो रहा है और दूसरी चीजें हैं इतनी हिंसा भी होती है और ये सब लोग एक्सपोर्ट एक्सपोर्ट करते हैं यहाँ से तो बोलते हैं एक तो हिंसा हो रही है दूसरा इन्वायरमेंट को इतना ज़्यादा संतुलित हो रहा है तो ये कह रहे हैं कि ऐसे होने से डेरी को लेना कहीं सी तरीके से भी जस्टिफाई है क्या दूध लेना डेरी लेना जस्टिफाई है क्या जस्टिफाई नहीं है हम अहिंसक हैं पूरे पूर्ण अहिंसक हैं और डेयरी मिल्क यूज नहीं करते as much as I loved and felt at home in India, two weeks was as long as I could keep myself away from Melody and our sanctuary in the woods. When you were a kid, did you get really dirty and your mom get mad? Um, I did get really dirty, but you know, I had a pretty cool mom. I don't think she got mad about it. How old are you now? I will be 50 in a few weeks. Oh, I forgot. One of the great Hasidic rabbis, Rebbe Nachman, taught that the day you were born was the day that God decided the world could not exist without you. And that is true for every being. That every being that has breath, God has said, the world cannot exist without them. And to honor God is to honor the holy breath of every being. And to see that the world 
needs each of us. I was very excited to have the honor and delight of sitting down with Rabbi Smooley Yanklowitz while he was attending a rabbinical conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Rabbi Yanklowitz is a social justice activist, a sought-after educational and motivational speaker, and the author of seven books on Jewish spirituality and ethics. He is the founder of the Shemayan Baharetz Institute, a graduate of both Harvard and Columbia, and the only person I've personally met who's donated one of his kidneys to a stranger. The Book of Psalms teaches that the world is built through kindness. We bring heaven down to earth by perpetuating kindness. In every interaction, in every act of food consumption, in every choice we make, we have the opportunity to elevate the sparks of holiness in whatever we encounter. We have the opportunity to objectify and abuse, or we have the opportunity to see the holiness in everything. When my children were born and I held them for the first time, the level of love I felt was so infinite. This is how God experiences all of God's creatures. Each creature is held with infinite love. And to take the godly perspective of the universe is to treat every being with love. To treat every being as an end in themselves. All of our religions teach this in their purest form. So the most central question we can ask ourselves every day is how will I increase compassion in the world today through my every choice? I long ago started just saying I'm a follower of Jesus Christ because even if you are not a Christian coming to that conversation, uh, you know enough about Jesus to think that you're going to generally agree with most stuff Jesus um, says. I mean, turning the other cheek and forgiveness and goodness. I mean, uh, most people agree that Jesus was uh, teaching the right values, even if they're not Christians. And, and it's because I love Jesus so much that I'm a vegan. I'm not uh, a vegan who um, also coincidentally is a Christian. I am full on a vegan because I love Jesus Christ. Although I'd already shot several hundred hours of footage, and I was a quarter way through the rough cut, I couldn't pass up the amazing opportunity to travel back to Manhattan and speak to Susie Welch, who is a business journalist, best-selling author, and a regular contributor on the Today Show. She's a devout evangelical Christian and an animal rights activist who currently sits on the advisory board of the Good Food Institute. Jesus' earliest followers, many of them were vegan because they got it. They got that Jesus was about mercy, compassion, and love, and life. Choose life. Give life. Stop killing. Show kindness to everything. And so Jesus' earliest fanatical followers were vegans. And at one point in Acts, Paul, frustrated with them, says, stop talking about what you're eating. You're sort of taking up all of our time with your vegan diet. And let's pay attention to other things. He had bigger sort of philosophical issues that he wanted everybody paying attention to. But we know historically that Jesus' earliest followers, the people sort of closest to his message, were vegan because of him. So it's not like, you know, I invented this. You know, I am like just following a tradition of, 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 of Christians all along who've gotten that connection. And the connection's been buried. It's been buried for a long time for cultural reasons, for cultural reasons. Uh, but then people come back to this concept of dominion. That's the big one for Christians. Well, God gave us dominion over all of his creation. Well, then... Um, you have to think about what dominion means. Well, God has dominion over us. What does that mean? God's dominion over us. He tells us exactly what dominion means. People like to debate what dominion means, but God tells us what dominion means. It means loving, nurturing, life-filled, hope-filled, compassionate, merciful, tender love. Okay? And if that's what dominion means, and God's demonstrating it towards us, which he is, uh then our, it's our turn to use that same exact bunch of uh, words in how we treat God's creation. And I don't know, slaughterhouses are not included in that. And so uh, for me, well, yeah, bring up dominion, bring it, because the Bible tells us what dominion is. And if you believe that dominion is what God tells us it is, then you have to stop eating animals. So Roman Catholics take scripture very seriously, but we always pair it with tradition, saying that we can't really even interpret scripture without the tradition as well. 
and the tradition on animals all the way to the catechism of the Catholic Church, the official teaching of the Catholic Church through the catechism is so interesting on animals, including a almost justice-like um, command saying that we owe animals kindness. Often in moral theology we think about justice as being what we owe other people. And the language of justice is used in the catechism of the Catholic Church. We owe animals kindness. That's unambiguous. And so much of what uh, we do today, of course, is inconsistent with that, and Catholics have to ask those questions. While in New York City, Victoria and I visited the beautiful campus of Fordham University, which was founded by the Catholic Diocese of New York in 1841. There we spoke with Charles Camozzi, an associate professor of theology and social ethics, and an author whose books include For Love of Animals and Peter Singer in Christian Ethics. I think so much of what it, where injustice comes from is our refusing to apply our principles consistently. So we say we believe this, but then when it comes to this other thing, where it looks like we have to act uh, um, a way contrary to the way we're currently acting, if we want to follow that principle seriously, we kind of abandon the principle. I use the analogy in my classes, um, arguments and principles are like buses, they're not like taxis. So if you have a principle, you gotta follow it wherever it goes, or, or you gotta get on a different bus. You can't just tell your principle wherever it's gonna end up, that's just being irrational. So, and so much injustice has come from that kind of irrationality. We, we, we believe in the dignity of the human person, except in slavery. We believe in nonviolence, except when we perpetuate war and the Crusades. We believe in the most vulnerable, except when it comes to um, how we eat. And so in the book, I'm trying to call all, all, all Christians to say, if we really claim to believe these things, we ought to change our whole lives. And, or let's not claim to believe these things, because if we just pick and choose where we end up as a result of these principles, we don't really actually believe the principles are true. And uh, to me, that's just what it means to be a, a Christian. It means following Christ in every aspect of your life, not just picking and choosing where you do that. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, the founders of Unity, were staunch vegetarians all their lives. Talked about it a lot. I think the archives has 135 talks from Charles Fillmore about being vegetarian. They wrote about it in their publications. And so, having been to seminary and knowing Unity's history, I knew they were vegetarian. I didn't know quite how ferociously they were until I became vegan and started reading more about it. So it turns out the founders of Unity, the church I was attending when I became vegan, were vegetarians in the late 1800s and even included it in their statement of faith until it was removed in 1939. So I joined Victoria at Unity Village in Missouri, where she arranged an interview with her friend, Reverend Ellen Devonport, Unity's Vice President of Content and Media to ask why no one at Unity had ever told me about this and to discuss how Unity could be more proactive in sharing Charles's teachings about not eating animals. A lot of people find Unity as refugees from rigid religions and so they're hypersensitive to being told what to do or being told they're wrong or bad and so Unity's leaders including me are probably pretty hesitant to talk about there is this other way to eat that you might find would enhance your spiritual journey. We may be moving in that direction. We have more and more ministers who are talking about it and who think Unity really should insist on it from World Headquarters, which isn't going to happen anytime soon because we don't want to tell people what to do. But we can talk about it and we can revive the idea that the Fillmore's preached vegetarianism and saw it as a spiritual practice. Learn how to eat better, get healthy, and help animals. Welcome to Main Street Vegan with your host, Victoria Moran. The Main Street Vegan podcast on Unity Radio is one of the ways Unity has begun moving back toward their vegetarian roots. And after speaking with Ellen, I look forward to seeing what other ways they'll find to honor Charles and Myrtle's original teachings about not eating or wearing our fellow earthlings. Over 74 billion farmed animals are bred and slaughtered every year, most of them while they're still just babies. 
And in the United States, they eat nearly 70% of the grain we grow. And raising them uses over 80% of our water and almost half of our land. And it's also the number one cause of water and air pollution, as well as deforestation, species extinction, and ocean dead zones. How long can we continue to try and justify this? All of the great spiritual traditions agree that along with life's joys, there will also be suffering. But so much of the suffering I see in the world around me is unnecessary and caused by the choices we make every day. Those choices are having a devastating effect on our individual and collective karma and health, and they're threatening the future of our children. My prayer is that each of us will challenge ourselves to be more kind and compassionate with our thoughts, words, and actions, to vote wisely with our dollars, and to take better care of all of creation, including our body temples, and to take the time each day to go within and ask some version of what can I do to make the world better for those yet to come. And then listen carefully for that still, quiet voice to answer. All around this great big world, I'm gonna let it shine. All around this great big world, I'm gonna let it shine. All around this great big world, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Eating fruit is help your brain like mine. This world of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This world of mine, I'm gonna let it shine now. This world of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hallelujah! Ah, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on um, the movie screening. And now we have time for a Q&A. Thomas Salish, uh, you want to, you know, maybe start the conversation with like um, the process of everything and how it happened. Well, the, my part of it's in the film, you know, basically seeing Cowspiracy and, and um, just I'd been vegan eight years. Somehow I didn't know anything about the connection between the environment and animal agriculture and melody was about two years old at the time and it just blew my mind and that you know i was an older father so i was like 40 45 when she was born so um <clears throat> so i felt like i've got to do something um and so yeah for me it all started with a meditation and to this day most everything the best things that work in my life somehow were born out of meditation so that's hopefully when people see this and when they see the docu-series that follows this and they see just exactly what you're able to do without any resources, somehow you're able to make all this stuff happen. Um, you know, and it's really just following our calling because the world needs each of us right now to be acting on our calling. You know, that's my main message to people is meditate and ask what you can do and then act upon it. Don't wait till you have everything because if I was waiting, I would still be sitting in that. I'm still sitting in the woods now, but none of this would have happened. So that's my main message. It's like, look at this example and, and go do your thing. We need you to do it, whatever your thing is. Yeah, in my case, I, in, I got involved because um, I had supported the three other documentaries, The Human Experiment and conspiracy and what the health so uh to me thomas's movie was the one that closed it out so that we look at what healing is all about what climate healing is all about because that's the nonprofit that uh, i started in 2007 and i wanted these documentaries to tell the story of how do you heal the climate now how do you, it starts with healing ourselves and then so to me, heal represents human, earth, animals, and love. And Thomas brought the love. 
you know, with the prayer for compassion. So, uh, so I was, you know, I mean, as soon as uh, Victoria proposed this, I said, I'm in and supported uh, Thomas throughout. So you can see the journey we went together on in Morocco and in India. And it's been amazing, Thomas. <laughs> I know. Wait, it, we've got two episodes of the docu series of us back in India. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you. And, and this time we're really we're on the ground and with the activists, you know, in a way that we weren't in this other one. I think. Is this right. uh, the compassion in action that you have? Right. Yes. Okay. So yeah. you know, I mean, I think something that will be really nice to do really quickly is to talk a little about the website that you have for a prayer for compassion. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put the link on the chat so anyone can you know access it there, but. Um, I see that there's like a couple of things that are really interesting that maybe you guys can enlighten us a little bit about. So, so this, uh, this part about the challenge, for example, mm. you want to mm. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, um, if you saw at the very end of the film, basically what I'm challenging each of us to try to find more ways to bring more compassion into our life. So if you go to the challenge, the Compassionate Living Challenge, it's basically just some writing and it, it's just different ideas on how to bring more compassion into your life and encouraging you to take better care of yourself that's another thing in the docuseries that we explore is self-compassion and self-care so this was the beginning of that in the challenge you know i have my four pillars of well-being which is um eating really healthy vegan plant-based food uh, meditating exercising and getting good sleep like if i do those four things man it's hard to get knocked off of my uh, game so uh you'll find stuff like that and also uh there's links to the and there's like links for the challenge and if you click there you will see all kinds of resources about how to go vegan why to go vegan uh how to meditate um different documentaries you may want to watch yeah, so all of that's there. Yeah, I am so surprised at the massive amount of resources that you have here. This is amazing. So um, uh, friends, you know, I put the link on the chat at prayerforcompassion.com. You can go there. And as you click on it, I mean, you can just keep going down if you want to. But, you know, right here, the challenge takes you right to the Compassionate Living Challenge, the four pillars that uh, Thomas was talking about, and then all these different resources. This is amazing. Great, great uh, website here to check out. Yeah, and I just put a link in the chat where you can see a prayer for compassion free. Oh, perfect. You know what? Let me actually put it with the... Feel free to share that with anybody. That's amazing. Thank you. There you go. On Zoom, you got to add the HTTPS so it can be like a direct link on the chat. So great. Uh, let me see if we have any questions submitted on Facebook or here. How long did it take you to um, do the whole process of the film from like shooting to or setting interviews to shooting and then, you know, editing and all that? Was it that a lengthy process? And could you give maybe some tips to people that maybe are trying to do something with their own causes, you know, inspired by compassion as well? Yeah, you know, um, I, I thought it would just be a few months that I would just interview a few people. Uh, but I started the first interview was... Um, I want to say in 2015, and then I the next one was next year. It was like Victoria, then Will, uh, Dr. Tuttle, and then overall it was uh, right at four years before we had our premiere. So it was a long process. It was a lot longer than I thought it would be, but <clears throat> it was a lot more in like what you saw on that screen was not what I intended. Like that was the universe saying, "This is your journey." So I would encourage anybody making any kind of documentary, especially because, um, you know, it's just follow, be open to how long, ever long it takes and uh, show up to air and say yes to everything, you know, and know the resources will show up when you do. Like when I got invited to Morocco, I was down to like zero dollars and I was like, uh, yes, my spirit says yes, but we'll see what happens. And then somebody came on like a uh, Holger who was in India, who traveled to India with me, he um, came on and provided the money to go to Morocco. I mean, to go to, to India or whatever, you know, so each step of the way, sometimes I, I was going and stepped out before the resources showed up, mm -hmm. but usually the resources showed up, but it never felt like everything was there. Like it never felt like, 
okay, I'm there. There's no insecurity. Like even when, after our first premiere uh, at the Vegan World 2026 and everybody loved it, I woke up in the middle of the night when going, oh, they're all vegans. It's like your mom saying you look good. You know, like they're going to be nice. Like I still had all that insecurity, <laughs> even though I could feel everybody's uh, appreciation for it. It mm. took a while before it could sink in that that there's so many people like us out there who are really compassionate and loving and <laughs> connected to our spiritual life. And really, and it breaks our heart when we see people we know who are just as spiritual and loving and compassionate, but they haven't made that little connection and applied it to the animals yet. So I think that's what really touches the heart of most vegans is uh, they're like, oh, I'm not alone, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can totally yeah. see that for sure. So there's a question though, uh, someone is asking, when will the docu-series be available for viewing? Right now it's being previewed. Um, I've mm -hmm. just finished it like last week, it's uh, being previewed. And so uh, I've been sharing the link with people and I, I'm, you know, just so in case there's anything that I missed, some, they can let me know and I'm, I'm tightening things up. And I just spoke with Jane uh, Velez Mitchell today, who's part in the docuseries, but we're going to, the docuseries is going to be available on uh, Unchained TV, will be one of the first places it's available, as well as I'm going to, I believe I'll create a Roku channel, a Roku channel, and a Amazon Fire channel, plus we have a vi our Vimeo, uh, I, I, I've already created a Vimeo showcase, so anywhere between two to three weeks, it's going to be out there uh and free ready for everybody to share and if you like this film you're gonna love this probably even more because, uh, <laughs> that's it's a lot more fun you know that's great that's awesome next question it's really for activists too it's, oh. it's a, my love letter to v to uh animal rights activists basically that's awesome that's great yeah. um i have another question here it says have you paid any attention to the negative effects of agribusiness for example the degradation of soil from herbicides or fertilizers do you have anything there to say? That's you, Slytus. Um, <laughs> uh, we haven't created a documentary around that, um, but we have created a documentary around the chemical pollution of the planet. It's much broader than that it's because you're looking at uh, the entire uh, industrial chemical gamut, you know, not just what's happening to agriculture. And that is the human experiment. And that's also available on Unchained TV. So I say, please go to Unchained TV and uh, uh, start browsing through. There's so much content there now. And if you were able to put that link on the yeah. chat, focus, I have no idea how to get there. So that'd be great. Um, another question here, it says, um, thank you for producing this film. I am vegetarian for 36 years, six of them vegan, strict vegan and whole food for the last three years. How can I start a conversation with others who are very much living up to the golden rule, who show compassion towards others, but yet they still consume animals. Hmm. This I feel like this question has been asked about me because I am the person that I feel like I do a lot of compassion, but I do eat animals. And I always, uh, this is such a journey. Like, But yes, please, can you answer this question? <laughs> well, I, first thing I'll say is like, I encourage you to watch the docuseries because um, in the episode two or three, I think it's two, I speak to Dr. Claire Mann and Dr. Or, or vegan psychologist Claire Mann and Dr. Melanie Joy. And we talk about shame and we talk, and, and Dr. Claire and uh, Claire Mann told me something that was really, I think is very helpful when you speak to other people, um, is that there's this thing uh, that happens uh, whenever we feel any negative feelings, like if we feel shame or guilt or anger or any of the things like that, the blood kind of leaves our uh, front of our brain and goes to the back of our brain, to like our uh, reptilian brain, to where we want to fight, uh, it's fight or flight. And what, what she says that's even more astonishing to me is that there's this thing called a contagion effect. So whenever you are in a conversation with somebody and it happens to one of you, it naturally wants to happen to the other. That's why you can be talking to somebody and suddenly feel uncomfortable and not know why, like you wanna get out of there, you wanna, you get angry with them or whatever. It's that, that thing. So I think it's very important when whoever you talk to is to, you know, make sure you're meditating, make sure you're able to stay present. <clears throat> and if they get triggered, cause some people will feel the guilt and shame just by knowing you're vegan 
And the second that happens, and they, if their blood's in the back of their brain, you can talk all day and give them everything in the world, and it's not going to mm -hmm. matter because they're not thinking clearly. So you really want to make sure whatever the conversation goes, you you have you're there they're there with you. Make sure you crack some jokes. You you give them a hug. You let them know that you know you really make it about. You don't ever make it about them to feel guilty. We live in a, a culture of shame. We live in where shame is making its profit. They make you feel uh, less than and unworthy, so they can sell you something to make you supposed to make you feel better. So it's easy to get triggered for any of us. So the best thing you can do is learn to keep the blood in the front of your head. Learn to be present with people and to um, to know and and when you're present with them, if you can be present, open and vulnerable, present to be there in the moment, open to hear what they have to say and vulnerable to say what you need to say, but in a loving and compassionate way where it's about them, where it's about we've all been duped, like we've all been uh, indoctrinated into the system of normalized violence and you know, and you and you have a gift. You know, you I, I mean, you may not know this, man, but I don't know if you're on any medication or anything or whatever, but I'm a veteran and I've been vegan 18 years this year and my blood work is perfect every year. And my family is suffering. <clears throat> and you see the docuseries, you'll see me talking about how much it's hurt me that I haven't reached my family and watching them suffer needlessly because of what they're eating. So I know that when I'm talking to somebody that if if they get this information and, and they take this, I call it the gospel, the good news, you know, the more I call myself a vegangelist and that's part of the, series, <laughs> the idea that the more you align yourself with your true compassionate nature, the better mm -hmm. you're going to feel. Whether you're vegan or not, you can always align yourself a little more with that true compassionate nature. Some of it's about taking care of yourself. Some of it's about all of these things. But the more you do that, the more you can be present with other people, the more you can tune into what's alive in them, what matters to them. It could be the environment, it could be their health, it could be whatever it may be, you know, and you find your in and then you share the information in a way, you know, you have a gift and you're giving them something and really be careful not to make them feel guilty because it's so important. My Angelou said this thing about, you know, people will forget what you say and what you do, but they remember how you make them feel. So as a vegan, it's important that we leave people feeling like, man, I want some of that, man. They're happy. They feel good. They look healthy. The more you take care of yourself, do those four pillars, the more you're going to be, more people are going to want what you've got to, to give. I mean, that's the main thing I have yeah. to say about that. But... Oof, amen. Yeah. That was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that's for sure. Big Angelus, for sure. <laughs> you convinced me. <laughs> yeah, no, that was yeah. great. Thanks for sharing that. So with me, it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's basically storytelling, no? It's about storytelling. And uh, and I, I, in the movie, I asked people, would you deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? I mean, I asked that in a school in Morocco. And uh, the kids said, you know, none of them said, you know, they would do it, right? And then I told them, we are all vegan at heart. So if we, do, if we would not deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily, you're vegan at heart. Except who you are and what you do are not in alignment, you know? And it means you're suffering. We are all suffering through this. So I say, well, we are all coming home to who we are, to our hearts. That's the journey of going from climate heating to climate healing. It's a systemic transformation. Okay. So I say we are stuck in a system that's making us heat the climate. And so, uh, and to transform from something, from uh, from one way of living to another way of living, requires some negative emotions. See, the problem with our system is that it tells us to avoid negative emotions. Any negative emotion is bad for you. But in reality, negative emotions are your mind telling you that there is something within you that needs to be changed. So if you start welcoming the negative emotions, then you can understand what is trying to tell you, and then you will make the right changes. Like I felt shame when, uh, when I found out what I was doing was wrong. You know? and, I, and I said, well, I mean, I don't want to feel this again. So I don't want to continue doing the same thing again. So I changed myself, right? And I also felt a huge sense of guilt lift off my shoulders when I went vegan. And that guilt had been carrying for 40 years, you know, because I had overheard my grandmother talking to my grandfather when I was a little child. That's where the guilt came from. 
So every time I was consuming dairy, I was subconsciously feeling that guilt. And I didn't know that. And that probably was the reason I had arthritis. You know, a lot of our ailments may be psychosomatic, for all we know. Yeah. So um, one month after I went vegan, my arthritis pains went away, magically. <laughs> right? So, and, and my, you know, and I had, I felt so light as a person. I felt, I uh, felt like I was a 16-year-old again, that I could do anything I wanted now. You know, I felt powerful. <laughs> Right? And uh, so I say that we are all coming home to who we are. It's a journey home. And because it's a journey home, uh, say we are all, you know, we are all trying to help each other along that journey because it's good for all of us. It's good for the planet. It's good for the animals. It's good for all of us, for our personal health also. Okay, so, and I say to people, you know, if you fall down in a journey, you know, I want to help you get up and continue the journey. So don't ever give up the journey home to who you are. Um, that's, that's the most important journey you could be doing. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so we are, we're coming sort of like to the end of this. I wonder if you, either of you had something that you would like to leave with our viewers uh, that are watching in their live now or that they will be watching this recording later. Um, anything that you would like to to leave with us tonight? Go ahead, um, Thomas. I would say for me is just um, the main thing I really try to encourage and leave everybody with is to really take care of yourself, like really love yourself. Like we had the golden rule today, you know, the panel we had today, what the idea of, you can't do unto others if you're not doing good for yourself. Like uh, you don't want to treat other people the way you're treating yourself if you're treating yourself bad. Like, so the golden rule implies that we need to treat ourselves with love and kindness and respect and and to um, to follow our calling. You know, um, if you're an activist, may, you know, I know you may feel guilty for uh, self-care but there's nothing to feel guilty about watch the docuseries because if you're an activist it's definitely for you or even if you're not it's it really the main message i want people to come away in the docuseries is we are all being called answer your calling take care of yourself love yourself and um know that the power to manifest what you're here to do because you are here for there's no way you're on this planet at this time without some kind of mission <laughs> You know, I don't know what it is, but I promise you, it may just be be kind to that cashier. I don't know, but do what it is you're here to do because um, my daughter needs it, and we all need you to do that. That's my main message: is love yourself. It's beautiful, Thomas. Uh, I, I uh, it is you know to to follow on from that. Uh, I say this is the oxygen mask rule for the planet. You know, in the oxygen mask rule is that you have to put on your own oxygen mask first before you help others. In the same way, we have to heal ourselves individually and as a species. Let's heal ourselves in a hurry because we have to go and heal the planet as well. Because, you know, if you take human beings out, the planet usually, people will say, hey, the planet will be fine if you take human beings out. But really right now, the planet needs us on the other side, helping the planet heal. Because we are powerful enough to destroy the planet, we are powerful enough to heal the planet. Okay, it's which way do we put our power towards? And right now it's systemic. There is nothing, you know, I mean, we are all trying to be good, but the system is driving us in one direction. So we have to create a system that pulls us in the other direction. And, uh, and then so that we can routinely be kind to all life, right? And uh, and that's that will happen when a lot of us start demanding it. So it has to begin at the grassroots. This is why it's very, very important that we make our personal transformations as quickly as possible. So that eventually the social transformation happens and the system transformation happens. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, not only being willing to share the movie, you know, on our platform during Golden Rule Day, 
but I find amazing having discussions talking about changes of systems through self-care and understanding that we need to love ourselves in order to love everybody else coming from a principle of millennia talking about treating others the way that we want to be treated and how deep this can go and how transformational it is and how action-based it is I'm truly grateful to be able to you know to showcase this in this platform and to to promote your work so thank you so much for joining us for the celebration thank you everybody that watched this webinar and this question and answer um happy golden rule day and happy next day golden rule day for people that are in australia already <laughs> um but yes yeah, thank you so much and we'll all these videos will be on our youtube channel if you subscribe to anything if you register for any of these events you will receive an email with a link to all these videos so thank you so much and we'll see you soon awesome thank you, thank you. Bye -bye.